जय Chapter 2 Prayers by the Demigods for Lord Krishna in the Womb. Dev Goswami said, Under the protection of Magadaraj, Jarasandha, the powerful Kamsa began persecuting the kings of the Yadu dynasty. In this he had the cooperation of demons like Pralamba, Baka, Chanura, Trinavrta, Agasura, Mushtika, Arishta, Dvivida, Putana, Kishi, Denuka, Banasura, Narakasura, and many other demoniac kings on the surface of the earth. Persecuted by the demoniac kings, the Yadavas left their own kingdom and entered various others, like those of the Kurus, Panchalas, Kekayas, Shalvas, Vidarbas, Nishadas, Videyas, and Koshalas. Some of their relatives, however, began to follow Kamsa's principles and act in his service. After Kamsa, the son of Ugrasena, killed the six sons of Devaki, a plenary portion of Krishna entered her womb as her seventh child, arousing her pleasure and her lamentation. That plenary portion is celebrated by great sages as Ananta, who belongs to Krishna's second quadruple expansion. To protect the Yadus, his personal devotees, from Kamsa's attack, the Personality of Godhead, Vishvatma, the Supreme Soul of Everyone, ordered Yogamaya as follows. O oh my potency, who are worshipable for the entire world, and whose nature is to bestow good fortune upon all living entities, go to Vraja, where there live many cowherd men and their wives. In that very beautiful land where many cows reside, Rohini, the wife of Vasudeva, is living at the home of Nanda Maharaj. Other wives of Vasudeva are also living there incognito because of fear of Kamsa. Please go there. Within the womb of Devaki is my partial plenary expansion known as Sankarshan or Shesha. Without difficulty, transfer him into the womb of Rohini. O oh, all auspicious Yogamaya, I shall then appear with my full six opulences as the son of Devaki, and you will appear as the daughter of Mother Yashoda, the queen of Maharaj Nanda. By sacrifices of animals, ordinary human beings will worship you gorgeously with various paraphernalia, because you are supreme in fulfilling the material desires of everyone. In different places on the surface of the earth, people will give you different names such as Durga, Bhadrakali, Vijaya, Vaishnavi, Kumuda, Chandika, Krishna, Madhavi, Kanyaka, Maya, Narayani, Ishani, Sharada, and Ambika. The son of Rohini will also be celebrated as Sankarshan because of being sent from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini. He will be called Ram because of his ability to please all the inhabitants of Gokula and he will be known as Balabhadra because of his extensive physical strength. Thus instructed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Yogamaya immediately agreed. With the Vedic mantra Om, 
she confirmed that she would do what he asked. Thus, having accepted the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, she circumambulated him and started for the place on earth known as Nanda Gokul. There she did everything just as she had been told. When the child of Devaki was attracted and transferred into the womb of Rohini by Yogamaya, Devaki seemed to have a miscarriage. Thus all the inhabitants of the palace loudly lamented, Alas, Devaki has lost her child. Thus the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the Supersoul of all living entities, and who vanquishes all the fear of his devotees, entered the mind of Vasudeva in full opulence. While carrying the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead within the core of his heart, Vasudeva bore the Lord's transcendentally illuminating effulgence, and thus he became as bright as the sun. He was therefore very difficult to see or approach through sensory perception. Indeed, he was unapproachable and unperceivable even for such formidable men as Kamsa, and not only for Kamsa, but for all living entities. Thereafter, accompanied by plenary expansions, the fully opulent Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is all auspicious for the entire universe, was transferred from the mind of Vasudeva to the mind of Devaki. Devaki, having thus been initiated by Vasudeva, became beautiful by carrying Lord Krishna, the original consciousness for everyone, the cause of all causes within the core of her heart, just as the East becomes beautiful by carrying the rising moon. Devaki then kept within herself the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the cause of all causes, the foundation of the entire cosmos. But because she was under arrest in the house of Kangsa, she was like the flames of a fire covered by the walls of a pot, or like a person who has knowledge but cannot distribute it to the world for the benefit of human society. Because the Supreme Personality of Godhead was within her womb, Devaki illuminated the entire atmosphere in the place where she was confined. Seeing her jubilant, pure and smiling, Kamsa thought, The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, who is now within her, will kill me. Devaki has never before looked so brilliant and jubilant. What is my duty now? The Supreme Lord, who knows his purpose, will not give up his prowess. Devaki is a woman. She is my sister. And moreover, she is now pregnant. If I kill her, my reputation, opulence, and duration of life will certainly be vanquished. A person who is very cruel is regarded as dead, even while living. For while he is living, or after his death, everyone condemns him. And after the death of a person in the bodily concept of life, he is undoubtedly transferred to the hell known as Andatama. Deliberating in this way, Kamsa, although determined to continue in enmity toward the Supreme Personality of Godhead, refrained from the vicious killing of his sister. He decided to wait until the Lord was born and then do what was needed. While sitting on his throne or in his sitting room, while lying on his bed or indeed while situated anywhere, and while eating, sleeping, or walking, Kamsa saw only his enemy, the Supreme Lord, Rishikesha. In other words, by thinking of his all-pervading enemy, Kamsa became unfavorably Krishna conscious. Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, accompanied by great sages like Narad, Devala, and Vyas, and by other demigods like Indra, Chandra, and Varuna, invisibly approached the room of Devaki, where they all joined in offering their respectful obeisances and prayers to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who can bestow blessings upon everyone. The demigods prayed, 
O Lord, you never deviate from your vow, which is always perfect because whatever you decide is perfectly correct and cannot be stopped by anyone. Being present in the three phases of cosmic manifestation, creation, maintenance, and annihilation, you are the supreme truth. Indeed, unless one is completely truthful, one cannot achieve your favor, which therefore cannot be achieved by hypocrites. You are the active principle, the real truth, in all the ingredients of creation, and therefore you are known as Antaryami, the inner force. You are equal to everyone, and your instructions apply for everyone, for all time. You are the beginning of all truth. Therefore, offering our obeisances, we surrender unto you. Kindly give us protection. The body may figuratively be called the original tree. From this tree, which fully depends on the ground of material nature, come two kinds of fruit, the enjoyment of happiness and the suffering of distress. The cause of the tree, forming its three roots, is association with the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. The fruits of bodily happiness have four tastes, religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation, which are experienced through five senses for acquiring knowledge in the midst of six circumstances namely lamentation, illusion, old age, death, hunger, and thirst. The seven layers of bark covering the tree are skin, blood, muscle, fat, bone, marrow, and semen. And the eight branches of the tree are the five gross and three subtle elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. The tree of the body has nine hollows, the eyes, the ears, the nostrils, the mouth, the rectum, and the genitals, and ten leaves, the ten airs passing through the body. In this tree of the body there are two birds. One is the individual soul, and the other is the super-soul. The efficient cause of this material world, manifested with its many varieties as the original tree, is you, O Lord. You are also the maintainer of this material world, and after annihilation you are the one in whom everything is conserved. Those who are covered by your external energy cannot see you behind this manifestation, but theirs is not the vision of learned devotees. O Lord, you are always in full knowledge, and to bring all good fortune to all living entities, you appear in different incarnations, all of them transcendental to the material creation. When you appear in these incarnations, you are pleasing to the pious and religious devotees, but for non-devotees, you are the annihilator. O lotus-eyed Lord, by concentrating one's meditation on your lotus feet, which are the reservoir of all existence, and by accepting those lotus feet as the boat by which to cross the ocean of nescience, one follows in the footsteps of the Mahajans, or great saints, sages, and devotees. By this simple process, one can cross the ocean of nations as easily as one steps over the hoofprint of a calf. O Lord, who resemble the shining sun, you are always ready to fulfill the desire of your devotee, and therefore you are known as a desire tree. When acharyas completely take shelter under your lotus feet in order to cross the fierce ocean of nescience, they leave behind on earth the method by which they cross, and because you are very merciful to your other devotees, you accept this method to help them.
someone may say that aside from devotees who always seek shelter at the Lord's lotus feet, there are those who are not devotees but who have accepted different processes for attaining salvation. What happens to them? In answer to this question, Lord Brahma and the other demigods said, O lotus-eyed Lord, although non-devotees who accept severe austerities and penances to achieve the highest position may think themselves liberated, their intelligence is impure. They fall down from their position of imagined superiority because they have no regard for your lotus feet. O Madhava, Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord of the Goddess of Fortune, if devotees completely in love with you sometimes fall from the path of devotion, they do not fall like non-devotees, for you still protect them. Thus they fearlessly traverse the heads of their opponents and continue to progress in devotional service. O Lord, during the time of maintenance, you manifest several incarnations, all with transcendental bodies beyond the material modes of nature. When you appear in this way, you bestow all good fortune upon the living entities by teaching them to perform Vedic activities, such as ritualistic ceremonies, mystic yoga, austerities, penances, and ultimately samadhi, ecstatic absorption in thoughts of you. Thus you are worshipped by the Vedic principles. O Lord, cause of all causes, if your transcendental body were not beyond the modes of material nature, one could not understand the difference between matter and transcendence. Only by your presence can one understand the transcendental nature of your Lordship who are the controller of material nature. Your transcendental nature is very difficult to understand unless one is influenced by the presence of your transcendental form. O Lord, your transcendental name and form are not ascertained by those who merely speculate on the path of imagination. Your name, form and attributes can be ascertained only through devotional service. Even while engaged in various activities, devotees whose minds are completely absorbed at your lotus feet and who constantly hear, chant, contemplate and cause others to remember your transcendental names and forms are always on the transcendental platform and thus they can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. O Lord, we are fortunate because the heavy burden of the demons upon this earth is immediately removed by your appearance. Indeed, we are certainly fortunate, for we shall be able to see upon this earth and in the heavenly planets the marks of lotus, conch shell, club, and disc that adorn your lotus feet. O Supreme Lord, you are not an ordinary living entity appearing in this material world as a result of fruitive activities. Therefore, your appearance or birth in this world has no other cause than your pleasure potency. Similarly, the living entities who are part of you have no cause for miseries like birth, death, and old age, except when these living entities are conducted by your external energy. O Supreme Controller, your Lordship previously accepted incarnations as a fish, a horse, a tortoise, Narasinga Dev, a boar, a swan, Lord Ramchandra, Parashuram, and among the demigods, Vamana Dev, to protect the entire world by your mercy. Now please protect us again by your mercy, by diminishing the disturbances in this world. O oh Krishna, best of the Yadus, we respectfully offer our obeisances unto you. O oh Mother Deviki, by your good fortune and ours, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself, with all His plenary portions such as Baladev, is now within your womb. Therefore, you need not fear Kamsa, who has decided to be killed by the Lord. 
your eternal son, Krishna, will be the protector of the entire Yadu dynasty. After thus offering prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, the Transcendence, all the demigods, with Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva before them, return to their homes in the heavenly planets. Thus ends the second chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Prayers by the Demigods for Lord Krishna in the Womb.